Okay, here we go. And it's uh, almost nine o'clock here, noon. Um, Love in here. Yeah, okay. All right. There is a lot to be said for having unscheduled time in the summer as a kid, having time to play, to daydream, and certainly, yes, to be bored. Got any boring stories for us, Jen? <laughs> I get bored sometimes. You know, I, <sighs> that sucks. Got uh, any boring stories for us, Jen? I've been thinking that so often when our kids say, I'm bored, what they're really looking for is a sense of purpose. They don't just want to do something that takes up time. They want to do something meaningful in the world. And very, very few kids and next to no 14-year-old boys are going to come up to you and say, dear parent, I would like to make a meaningful contribution to the world today. But that may be what's going on underneath. What do you think? I think you are exactly right. And I'm chuckling because I had, I was at the lake yesterday. I think you're absolutely right. I'm chuckling because I was at the river yesterday with my niece and nephew, and he just turned 12. And, you know, <laughs> life is just, you know, stressful and hard right now. But we were playing, and they were talking about how they wanted to live there forever. Fast forward 30 minutes, 45 minutes, he comes up to me and he says, can we go now? I'm bored. And I just looked at him and I said, you know, the world does not revolve around your boredom. And I did not say another word. And we ended up there for three more hours and there was never another word about I'm bored. Interesting, interesting. What did you see him doing after that point in, in those three hours? Well, he ended up being out in the waves with the air mattress and playing with the other kids that were there. You know, it was like he just needed a, a, a space, a moment of mm -hmm. time to just be like, pause, hit refresh, go on. Yep. And we tend to, some of us tend to like cap, hold on to that little I'm bored and then we like vomit on them of well you can do this and you can do that and how about this and there's always chores yes yeah you know we all need a moment of silence and that time to just be in that little bit of discomfort you know we as don't adults, have we're the we're problem solvers right so when our kid says I'm bored. Well, what about this? What about that? Plus, let's face it, we're often kind of annoyed and resentful that I'm like, you're kidding? You're bored? My list of things to do is 83 things long and it's only 8.30 in the morning. If you're bored, why don't you? And we Take half my list. Go exactly. ahead. So we go yes. off on that tangent, which is not helpful for our kids. Uh, Yes, they need to have useful things to do. Yes, they can contribute to the work of the family, but that's not the best way to go about it. Right, right. So let's talk about summer jobs. I was doing a little research for this podcast and came across the statistic. In 1978, 60% of teens had summer jobs, and now it is about 35%. So about half of teens are now working. And there is a lot to be said about letting your kids have summer jobs, encouraging them to have summer jobs. It is a step towards independence that is so, so important. And one article I came across was titled, Teens Should Have Summer Jobs, The Less Glamorous, The Better. <laughs> I did some digging too into this and best I can find the statistics for teens that are working this summer are kind of like that 35, 40% depending on where you're at. And it's interesting when you dig into some of the factors that are influencing this. A few years ago, it was that uh, generally speaking, it was 
hard for teens to get jobs because so many adults were out of work and looking for work. The good news, if you have teenagers in your life right now, is that in a lot of places that has changed and rebounded and they're expecting that due to a tight labor market, there are more people who need employees than there are people looking for work. So it's easier now for teens to get jobs than it was a few years ago. So that's, that's a positive thing. Some of the other social factors that are feeding into that statistic are a little harder to deal with though. And I see it where I live. One of the issues is that sports have become a year round thing. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like, you don't just play on one baseball team. You play on your, maybe your rec league and then also your travel team and then also the tourney team. And so it becomes this, commitment that is literally every day of the week. In some other places, kids are spending so much time working on brushing up academics. You know, they're, they're doing tutoring, they're doing enrichment courses, they're doing language camps. These can all be wonderful things. I'm not saying that they're not, but it is taking up teen time in a way it didn't used to in the right. past. And even some places, it's that you know, children are traveling with their families. Again, fantastic if you have that opportunity or they're going on mission trips. And so much of this is in an attempt to be a good candidate for, you know, whatever college or what you're looking for. And so these are all things that are keeping teens out of the workforce and making it more challenging, difficult, and less, less socially expected and acceptable for them to work in a lot of places. And I think those factors are a lot more challenging to deal with. Mm -hmm. Do you see some of that where you are? Definitely. But I, I think your point about looking good for college applications, you know, oh, we're going to go on the mission trip to Mexico and build houses. Oh, we're going to do an internship at my father's friend's law office or mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. But what colleges are looking for is kids who know who they are and know what they want and are well-rounded and have empathy and social skills. And sure, you're going to get some of that in those occupations, but um, especially this one article maintained that scooping ice cream and flipping burgers will give you insights into human beings in a way that you will never get anywhere else. It is seeing the other side of people mm -hmm. being on, you know, at which if you are on the receiving side of a rude customer, you better believe that you will probably never be that rude customer. So yes. that is a lesson that parents cannot teach. It's a lesson that you have to live I saw it with my girls when they became servers in their, you know, in high school. Whoa, their tip meter went up. They <laughs> gave really big tips because they knew what that person on the other side of the table, how hard they were working. So it builds empathy in that way. And it also gives kids feedback that you can talk till you're blue in the face, dear parents, but when your boss says, right, no, 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 you cannot be late to work and you get penalized or you get fired, that is social feedback that is invaluable. Better to learn it. And I was thinking about our conversation around risk and taking those little baby steps when they're young. This is the place where when you're 14 and you're getting this social feedback from a boss, better to learn that at 14 with a minimum wage flipping burger job than when you're out of college and here's your first real job and you're getting that social feedback. That's the piece that as I was reflecting on all of this, I think is missing and we need to reframe. We need to put as part of the, the, bigger picture of parenting and helping our kids be prepared for adult life, that jobs are a really important way to do that. Like that's the piece that's missing. Everybody talks about sports and enrichment and trips, but people aren't really thinking about the value of jobs. 
Yes. Like you said, all of those things are very, very, very valuable ways to build those essential skills and competence, confidence, this feeling that I can contribute, which helps a lot with that. I'm bored. I feel like everybody's just basically telling me to sit around until I'm 18 and then they want me to do something, but they've never let me do anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And learning to manage your time. You know, if you've got a teen in the house and even a preteen and, uh, you know, I'd say even late elementary school, if your kids are not waking themselves up, whoa. I have a funny story about that. I love your funny stories. (laughs) So my 12 year old, um, something happened a few weeks ago and as a consequence, his phone got taken away for a while. And like pretty much most people now in the 21st century, he uses the alarm on his phone to wake himself up. So what we realized in this period where he didn't have his phone was how many ways in which he uses his phone as a tool, right? So that first night I'm tucking him in bed and he's like, oh wait, I I can't set my alarm. Like, I I don't know what to do about this. And oh shoot, now I guess I have to wake you up in the morning. So I, I was up anyway, the next morning I woke him up Next night, I'm tucking him in bed, and I look over, and he's got a clock in his room. He has an alarm clock in his room. None of us even realized it. He certainly didn't know what that was or how to use the alarm clock. So it became this teaching lesson of how we did it back in the old days. In the old days, setting an alarm clock. (laughs) Yes, yes. Oh, boy. Yes. So, um, yeah, he set the alarm clock, and uh, as you know, this 12-year-old son of mine does work. He has his own lawn mowing business and he gets himself up when he needs to, to go out and make sure that his clients get taken care of. So that's something that he's learned to do. And I think that's a great life skill. That is a great life skill. And I'm excited to say that we got to talk with him and our upcoming episode is going to feature the entrepreneurial (laughs) Sam and his lawn service business. And he is so wise, Jen. And he would not, I mean, I'm, you know, you're, you're a good parent. I see that, but he's learning things that you could not teach him. You could guide him in that direction, support him, facilitate, but he, you know what you were saying before about the importance of getting feedback from others not just parents, not just grandparents, and not just teachers. I know teachers work with children a lot too, but let's face it, kids after a certain point kind of put their teachers in the same category of parents and they just roll their eyes, let whatever that feedback is, you know, just roll away. I don't, a few more months and I'm done with you kind of thing. When my oldest was six years old and he started selling vegetables down at our local green market, he got a lot of feedback from all kinds of people in the community. Uh, There are a lot of um, senior citizens that would come down to the green market because they were available during the day, but they told him, you know, what they thought about his radishes. And you really should clean those off before you bring them down. Oh, so he learned that. You can't just pick them and group them. They sell better if you wash them off first. Things like that, just Mm -hmm. little things like that and, and how people, respond if you, hi, how are you? How are you doing today? You engage people in conversation, you make more sales. These are just such subtle little things that he picked up on. And the other really important thing he picked up on and kids can get in a work environment is you see how other people, other employees also are interacting with with customers, clients, whatever you have. And so you learn from them Mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. And everybody has their own ways of doing things. And we all learn from those around us. And when your children get the opportunity to be in a work environment, suddenly their world expands a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't resist asking Jen. Yeah. What was your first job? Well, 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 I did a lot of babysitting when I was younger. I was just thinking of this recently when I was uh, 13 and 14, not sure about 12, I babysat full time in the summer. You know, I would be at somebody's house Monday through Friday, taking care of their kids while they were at work. And Mm -hmm. I have a distinct memory of this one family I took care of in the summer. And these kids loved two things. They loved SpaghettiOs and they loved Pee Wee Herman. And I hate both of those things. (laughs) 
Oh my gosh. It was like, <laughs> so I did that. Um, when I was 16, I worked at the canning factory and wow. yep. The canning factory is, you know, peas, peas, corn, you know, going in the can. And I worked 10 hour days, six days a week at the canning factory. And I did it because at that point it was the job that would make me the most money because you got paid overtime time and a half after 40 hours. So you got 20 hours at time and a half. Wow. I was saving money for college. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that that job really did for me, for me, it showed me, I don't want to do that type of work for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. And mm -hmm. it was a really good incentive to uh, keep doing other things. Mm -hmm. So those were my first jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you? Well, the babysitting, of course. And if, you know, I would encourage your boys to be, and maybe we call it something different because babysitters, I don't know, that's kind of a funny term, but your boys can be out there playing with other boys. And there's so many moms out there who would just be like, yes, take my five-year-old out and run him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, market yourself that way. I will exercise your child or <laughs> something like that. Pro tip, if you can find a family of boys and your son is looking for work, they would probably love to have an older boy take care of those younger ones because I learned this firsthand. There's a tolerance level, like boys understand other boys. The worst is when you get a babysitter who is a girl from a family of girls and you bring her into your family of boys because no, she don't. Don't yeah. do it. Just yeah. don't do it. So one of my first jobs, and I was 16, was a newspaper subscription. You know, you go into the big room and you have the script and you call people. Oh, no. Oh, man. That lasted for like maybe a day or two. It was <laughs> awful. Okay, so now I know I don't want to work in a cubicle. There we yeah. go. That's good to know. But that's an essential life, life lesson you just yeah. learned. <laughs> Did you just flip your pen? Yes, <laughs> yes. My pen just went flying, Janet. My pen cap. God. <laughs> um, my second job that I had for, for a longer period of time was working for an old Italian baker. And he had a pie shop in Houston. And looking back on that now, as we are in the Me Too movement and some of the things that he talked about, Ooh. which I was, I had no idea. And I really, I had no idea that this was wrong, right? that this was not okay. So, so just hindsight, looking back at that, how many years, 40 years ago, wow, that was, that was my entry into the workforce was this older man who he never touched me, but his language mm -hmm. really inappropriate, but mm -hmm. I didn't tell my parents cause man, I wanted that job because yeah. I was saving money to buy my plane ticket to travel to Oregon, to be here in the summer with my, with my, with my aunt and my cousins. And so I had a strong goal in mind, but I made pies. We made meringue, like lemon meringue pies, coconut cream pies. Oh my God. Pie crusts, the big, huge floor mixers. Yep. Mixing up meringue, slinging it with my hand onto the pies. And it was, oh my goodness. It was a hard job. Also made me realize I never want to work in food service yeah. or food. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a good experience. You got to show up on time. You got to go even when you don't feel like going. Yep. You have to deal with uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable people. Um, I, it was definitely a window into a world that I would never have been exposed to otherwise, for good or for bad. One of the things that I'd been thinking very recently, even before we decided to do this podcast, my kids work. All four of my kids work. Um, a couple of them have started their own businesses and the other ones are currently, they work at least part-time for their dad. Their dad has this smoothie business where they have carts and they will go to events like a baseball tournament, a volleyball tournament, a dance competition, you know, you name it. They'll set up and they'll sell smoothies at this event. So my guys do this. They all know how to work, which is wonderful. My, um, 
not my oldest, but my oldest at home kid right now, my 17 year old, he's got one more year here. So I've been thinking like, what do I need to teach this child yet before he goes out into the world? You know, what skills is he missing? And I had the sudden realization that none of my kids have ever filled out a job application. Oh, they've all worked. And they all do work, but none of them have ever filled out a job application because they've never worked for someone else, a boss who is not family. Ah. And so I talked about some of that with my 17 year old and he said, and I agree with him. He's like, I think I can figure out how to fill out a job application. And I'm sure he can. But it also made me realize that they are missing out on that piece of working for a boss. You shared that article about the you know, non-glamorous jobs, and there is something to that. There just mm -hmm. is. And this is something that I likely won't be able to change. You know, my, my guys, they're working for their dad, and they're doing their own businesses, and let's let them run with that. But I think they're kind of missing that experience. Yeah. And it'll be harder when they do do that at some point. I don't know. Well, and it's the experience, and, and this goes back to our risk risk taking it's that experience of application and unfortunately now they're mostly online but um you know taking that piece of paper and your hands are shaking and you walk in the door and you have to talk to the adult in charge yep. and present yourself and say i'm here to apply for ice cream scooper and then you have to interact in that interview situation. I applied for a retail job when I was uh, 16. This was working at a store in town and filled out my application. And I had to go up to the office to talk a little bit. So little, you know, interview. And I had to take a test. Because this was customer service and there was, a, you know, cashier, uh, cash register kind of stuff, part of this test was, it was basic math, you know, making sure that I could make change and add and subtract. I was so nervous doing that. And I had A's in math all the way through up until that point in my life. Like there, I had no real reason to think that I would fail this test. But, oh, was I, I was more nervous taking that test than I was taking my ACTs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so again, start when the stakes are not high. Mm -hmm. Start when they're young. And I think most states, 14 is the age that you can work part-time legally. It, it is important to look at your, your state's rules. And mm -hmm. kids have been working off the books for all of human history, right? I mean, babysitting, lawn mowing, those things are usually entrepreneurial things that kids do on their own. But it doesn't hurt as a parent to look into what the rules and regulations in your state are. Um, at, at some states anyway, at a certain age, a kid will need a job permit. You know, how do you do all that? You can easily look this information up online right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, for each individual state. So I was kind of brainstorming some job ideas. Shall we talk about some ideas if you're Absolutely. struggling with how, how do I employ my child? Um, pet sitter, so dog walker. Mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing about some of these jobs that we're talking about is these are things that even very young kids can start doing. I, I mean, I'm thinking it's not unreasonable for a kid as young as nine who loves animals and is responsible with an animal at home to offer their services to take care of somebody's animals when they're on vacation. Yes, mm -hmm. you as the parent are going to have to maybe drive them. If they're close enough, maybe they can ride their bike. But these are things that kids can start in small doses that yeah. don't have to take up a lot of time, but build a lot of skills and responsibility. Definitely. And mother's helper is a great way to start into babysitting, into mm -hmm. childcare, um, so that the mom is home, but hey, come over and play with my kids so I can, you know, get the laundry done or whatever, or read a book and take a bath, but that they're, so they're beginning to learn. I know. What is that? <laughs> that sounds so heavenly. Can I hire a mother's helper? Yes, you can. My 12 year old and 17 year old. <laughs> and do your work for you. Come but that's a, just a great way to start. And boys may not think about that as a viable job opportunity. Um, but it's basically go over and play with the kids while the mom is there and, you know, learn how to 
fix them snacks while the mom is there. Mm -hmm. There are always Red Cross babysitting classes. I think it's important for kids to take as preparation for that kind of work. Um, as you know, yard, lawn care is... I want to back up to this uh, child care thing for a yes. minute because I was doing some research for this too. And uh, the national average pay for a babysitter, what do you think it is, Janet? 15. Gosh. Yeah. 1344 per hour. I know. It blows my mind. Crazy. I know, again, I live in rural Midwest, so we are, we are definitely below that here. Yeah. But point being, your kid can make some serious ka -ching Yeah. doing babysitting. Yeah. Yeah. And to gain that experience in small doses, start out small and Probably you've got a neighbor somewhere close by, so you're within earshot or quick phone call. You can help out too if need be. Um, so think about little things like that, places for them to start. Mm -hmm. Start small and build your business like some wise entrepreneur we know that our listen listeners are going to be hearing from in our next podcast. So lawn mowing has been a big, big business for my family. Uh, my oldest son started a lawn mowing business when he was 11. I think he started with a push mower. Um, he progressed to a ride on lawn mower. And then by the time he was 16, this boy had a truck, a trailer, a ramp. I mean, he went all around and he provided services everywhere. And he really built up his base, uh, his client base. And he did this by providing good service, by being timely, by listening to their feedback. Uh, he developed a really good reputation and he made significant money doing this. So my youngest son, who is now 12, when he wanted to start a lawn mowing business, when my oldest was still at home, he didn't want little brother horning in on this. But when he left for college, the oldest one said, I'll sell you this lawn mowing business. And that's how my youngest got into lawn care. Wow. And at this point, he's got, uh, I don't know, something like 18 clients. He's 12 years old. He's got 18 clients this summer. And there is money to be made. Mm -hmm. There is, And it's hard work. It's hard work. And we're going to hear yes. from him next time about how he manages his schedule mm -hmm. and his thoughts about other kids going into business. Mm-hmm. Da, 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 wrap up. What you got? Should we, should we go through some of these other job ideas? Yeah, I didn't really like them. Actually, tutoring is a good Oh, one. I got some. I, I'll, I'll okay, go. Okay, you go. So I stumbled across an article that was written a few months ago. It was a Forbes magazine article about high paying summer jobs for teens. So of course I clicked on that. We'll include the link in our show notes, but a couple that stood out to me, tutoring. If you have a son who does well academically or he's strong in a particular area, there's money to be made in that as well. And I think I found the national average for a tutor is $20 an hour. Wow. And if you have an older teen who does really well, that teen could maybe help peers with, you know, even uh, SAT, ACT preparation, but could definitely work with, you know, like a, a middle school kid who may be struggling in math. Uh, and it suggested that a great way to find these opportunities is by, you know, offering your services, telling your teacher that, hey, you're available and interested because they may know other kids and families who need a little bit of help. A couple others that I thought were really um, potentially useful, youth sports ref. And I know there's a lot of kids around here that do that. You know, youth sports is such a big, big deal and a lot of kids play. Therefore, they, their availability is um, pretty erratic. But the kids even younger than them, they need refs for soccer games. They need mm -hmm. refs for the baseball games. So uh, in some cases, you do have to do like a training certification course, but it says it's usually, you know, a day long and... The, the article I read was talking about, you know, for a soccer referee, you know, getting like $25 a game, $30 a game. If there's a tournament, you can do multiple games in a day. So something else to, to look for. Well, and that really highlights, you know, find out what your kid's passionate about 
help them see a bigger picture Mm -hmm. and the possibilities around that. As you were talking, I was thinking about um, my girls used to love, we'd have craft camp and Mm -hmm. we'd do projects and a boy, a teen could certainly put together, hey, come over, we're going to make we're going to build birdhouses or we're going to do whatever, build, have a Lego building camp and, and have these two or three or five hour camps that are, you know, at your house or at the other family's house, however you want to work it out, but that they are the leaders of putting this project together. And moms are, you know, parents are grateful because your kids are occupied and focused yes. on an activity. I love that Lego camp idea. I mean, a boy could make a killing doing something like that because people like me, when my kids were younger, you constantly need somebody to just keep these kids busy for a few hours so I can get something done. Yes. And we've alluded to it. We haven't said this explicitly, but these jobs are all great ways for boys to experiment and learn what they want to do in the wider world. Maybe your kid learns that he doesn't really like working with small children. That's an important thing to learn. And I'd rather have him learn that when he's 16 than go get a degree planning to be a PE teacher and find out he hates working with little kids, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whatever your kid's interest is, together maybe have a conversation and brainstorm. How could he explore that and make some money at the same time? And you can start young, really young. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, hmm. let's wrap this up. Let's, what do we got? So tell us what was your first job and what are your kids doing this summer? I would love to hear some stories about your boys and their jobs. Good enough. 